So next up, we'll hear from Peter Bur Andersen, who is a partner and creative director at the, the city development agency Brick, uh, based in Copenhagen. So very welcome to Mama. Thank you so much, Martin, and uh, thank you, Vilbors, for inviting me also. Um, I think I'll start uh, by showing you a picture, uh, and that picture means uh, a lot of a lot for me. So it's this picture. So the picture tells everything about how I became the we. Because when I started uh, my company in 2008, it was only me. And my mission was to redefine the way we did retail in urban areas so that retail became more of a community driver than a transactional place. And I was very deep into that and I even wrote an article, I think nobody read it, uh, but then one day, on a bus, I met this fantastic guy. CERN was his name, is his name. And CERN just uh, bought uh, an old industrial area in uh, Copenhagen. And we talked a little bit about philosophy and a little bit about urbanism and how these neighborhoods should change. In the and then he said, but Peter, it's all fine. But in this place, we're going to do a small supermarket and we're going to do a lot of commercial things and then an office. And I was living like 200 meters away from that and, and I said, oh, how long is this bus trip? So then we started to discuss, could we do something else? And in the end, we sort of like had a good understanding of each other. Four weeks later, he called me and asked him, me to come to his office. And then we got the keys to this place and started to redefine uh, the substance of, of this area and it actually became a catalyst for regeneration of the, of the entire neighborhood. And uh, so it's more by coincidence, but now it's today, it's very known. We have a, a microbrewery called uh, Bruce uh, in the place. We have a circular restaurant called Best, a pizzeria. We have a cinema. We have four small enticing stores and we have a creative school. So it's like some 20,000 square meters. And that led to other developers starting to contact me. So instead of being a supplier and a service provider to the retail industry, we actually got a foot into the real estate uh, business. And basically, we are a group now of uh, 30 people, and uh, I'm probably the least academic of, uh, of the entire group, but I'm very hands-on, and I have a good understanding of not the life between buildings, because that's not so much my métier, you could say, but the life within the buildings, which I find actually even more interesting. So basically what we do, we work in three scales. We work in the small scale where I'm grown up, designing restaurants, coffee shops, bakeries, uh, offices, um, um, retail spaces, etc. And basically, I think in the real estate business, the idea of programming your sort of like public accessible spaces in a commu community-oriented way is quite important. Because if you are able to do that, you're also able to inform architects how buildings they should look like. Because when I started working in the re real estate industry in 2012, it was a little bit like, these are the buildings, these are the structures, go and fix the content. But basically, that's the wrong way. Because if we w really want to create lively, diverse, you could say, uh, mixed neighborhoods, we should start thinking about content. We should start thinking about defining the life we want to live and the syner synergies between the different operators and the different users in the area. And when we have a vision for that, okay, then we can start talking about structures and volumes. So basically, our sort of like vision is with these three disciplines, spatial design, architecture and urban life or master planning, we can actually have an impact on how people live their lives uh, in neighborhoods in the future. 
And then, of course, we have to be very good at making sure that the vision is actually realized. And uh, this is uh, a great deal of the work we do at the company. So why is this more important than ever? It's more important than ever, if I look at a Copenhagen perspective, we have um, one out of eight suffering from loneliness. We have 90% uh, of the time, the entire time we spend is inside. We have 70% of the population of Copenhagen are singles. We have, um, you could say, 17% uh, 70 per suffers from bad health. And all this in concentrated urban areas. And you would say unlocking, you could say, the answers and releasing the, say, the, the powers of urbanism to actually solve this uh, is uh, sort of like, I would say, our sort of like dream scenario and what we really strive to work for. Because we want to live in a, let's say, in a city where when people are asked to describe their home, that they start talking about their neighborhood instead of what happens within their four walls. We want to uh, contribute to that when people leave their offices or leave their home and go to their offices, that they actually feel as much as at home in their office or in their, you could say, business community than they do at home. Uh, we want to make sure that people use public transportation as much as possible. Basically, we want to influence that when you live in a city, you're actually using the city. And another aspect of that, which is very interesting, can you imagine 100 years ago in Copenhagen, the average Copenhagener had a, let's say, a, a, let's say a housing area of 15 square meters. 50 years ago, that number went up to 30 square meters. Today, an average Copenhagener lives with 60 square meters. So it doesn't matter really how biogene I can build a house uh, with sustainable materials and stuff like that. If we all want to live in larger places, we will never solve a uh, climate crisis. We need to be able to live smaller, live more communal, uh, and maybe even build a little bit higher. And we started to do that in, uh, in Copenhagen over the years. So basically, Urbanism and the right way to work with urbanism can solve a lot of these issues that we are looking in uh, today. And even commuting. If you're commuting to work back and forth every day, maybe you don't need a gym because you're actually exercising while you're going to work instead of sitting in, in your car. So all these things drive then uh, some values at, at our little community at Brick. So when we work with urban uh, creation, we always say whatever we do, it has to be community driven. If it's not community driven, it's not working. We all know when we are traveling abroad, where do we want to go into a restaurant? It's where the locals are. Because we believe that if the locals go there, then it's nice, then the poetry can, can sort of like happen. I don't know, Martin, there's a quote I need to... It's community driven. But we also want uh, everyone to think everyday life first. We also want to make sure that it's site specific because I cannot take what I'm doing in Copenhagen and place in Malmö because Malmö is a different beast and a different creature and it needs to be sort of like whatever we do needs to come out of what Malmö is. And then of course the experiences because people are not looking so much for goods and products anymore as they are for experiences. So how, uh, like your place here, Martin, is a, is a fantastic experience for me to come here and see, uh, let's say, the mix and match of, uh, of, of this entire organism uh, here. So, so basically, there are so many good values that you can bring into, let's say, creating healthy and uh, sustainable vibrant urban environments, both also mental and physical health, but also sustainable people profit the uh, planet. And then I would say the final thing is because a lot of things, uh, before I go into a little bit of examples, but a lot of the things that we work with is uh, sort of like strategies and plans and a little bit of drawings and you know like, and then we hand them over to 
our clients, which are in the real estate business. And then sometimes we see that, let's say, the potential is not really, uh, let's say, uh, transformed into uh, realization. So we also have a small team uh, at our space that are working uh, to attract the operators that we think should be the components to catalyze the vision. So basically, we are yeah, uh, walking around, looking at the city landscape and thinking, okay, these are very interesting operators. Maybe they could add value to the district that, that we are trying to, to work with. So, so it's, it's really uh, tactical, even more tactical than strategic what we are working with. And of course, we work with, let's say, the urban development as part of a process, you know, like asking uh, people, asking community, also a little bit with early activation, less and less. I was talking to Marlin this morning in Carlsberg City District, where, where, where we're working a lot. We had a lot of early activation and it got so popular. So when we started building, we had to, of course, ask them to leave. And Copenhagen was, you know, like thinking, why is that leaving? We want it to be present here as a permanent thing. And so, so I sort of like came to maybe the conclusion that early activation is very good, but be careful not to make it too good when you're working. And then, of course, retail with a purpose. I love retail. It's my background. I think supermarkets and stores and whatever are also meeting places. But retail today, it needs to be, uh, be with a purpose and, 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 you know, like talking with the big chains and how can they actually... Uh, let's say, convey their sort of like concept or their offering so that it fits the, the, the local realm is, is very interesting. If we look a little bit about uh, some projects that we have been working on, since 2017, we have been involved in the Carlsberg City District, which is a, an old industrial uh, area uh, that is now being transformed into a vibrant mixed uh, city district. We have around uh, 600,000 square meters of buildings and around 60,000 of them are like public accessible. So meaning cultural institutions or schools or uh, retail stores or cinemas or so it's, it's quite a significant number. And uh, we made a strategy for that that we then have uh, laid out into uh, 10 zones each zone has a specific narrative and has a specific, you could say, reason for, for being there. And some interesting aspect when you are dealing with this, you, you remember 90% of the time that we are spending is inside. The 10% we are spending outside, 70% of that time we are spending in the queue zones. So that means... Basically, that's also a, a little bit of uh, pushing a little bit to the agenda that we're actually more interested in what is happening close or within the buildings than we are interested in what happens outside the buildings as human persons. So there, there's a little bit of, uh, you could say, energy to be converted from maybe uh, the urban squares that we are talking so much about to what happens in the sort of like the the meeting between the outside and the inside. And maybe we really are more interested in, in being within this house than out on this uh, square, at least uh, for the 340 days uh, with, uh, with a little bit bad, better weather than today. Um, so when we're doing concepts, then we're also struggling in new city districts because uh, we don't have uh, circulation of people when we're starting to build. So basically, you have to be really innovative in terms of what type of uh, operators you're inv inviting in. And just a few examples. This is uh, a company called File Under Pop. They do paint and tiles. And, but they also they made a store in Carlsberg City District where they also have a workshop inviting people in in order to explore. You could say, how do we work with colors and textures and stuff like that? And then they have a vision and maybe uh, they're a little bit too early because they wanted then, when they close at 6, 7 in the evening, they want to convert the entire operation to a cocktail bar. So instead of mixing paint and colors, you 
mix liquids and ice cubes uh, together. And then you have a double program. Basically, you have two operations sharing the space, sharing the rent, and then optimizing the space for profit. Or like Oatman's, he makes uh, Danish open sandwiches, and he was very early on getting on board in Carlsberg city district as well. And Adam said to me, but there's not traffic enough. We have to rethink the idea of our operation. So basically, that's just a cover, his restaurant. It's a fantastic restaurant. But behind, he has more than 1,000 square meters when, where they are making open sandwiches for the local community, for the offices, the smaller businesses, and bringing them out uh, for lunch packages. So basically, he has what I call a hybrid concept. So a concept where they are making actually more type of businesses within the same hours. So, that, uh, so all this, let's say, commercial part of the business, the, the, the city stands on commercial, recreational and cultural legs, but the commercial part has been sort of like given out to the free market for many, many years while uh, municipalities uh, were, I think, more involved in the recreational and the cultural part of, uh, of the city. But basically, I think our vision at Brick is to sort of like, how can we make sure that the commercial part of the business has an equal right and is being treated uh, as an equal uh, player. The same, we've been working for many, many years at the uh, uh, North Harbor in uh, Copenhagen, thinking also uh, a little bit the same, uh, along the same line, but, but ba basically also like, like this, what you see on the right-hand side, for me, the left-hand side from you, is a Panomal studio. They were looking for a place where they could sell their bicycling clothes. And we were very inspired also by Rafas in, in London. So now we created like a thousand square meters together with them, with a community where they have a, their bicycling club. Hundreds of people meet every day with their bikes going out from there. They have a cafe. They also have their uh, small shop and they have their workspace. So basically, to start thinking what type of businesses are there locally who could actually, let's say, become a more central player in, in the community than they would be if they were only uh, and purely uh, commercially uh, driven. And then, of course, then you go in to the spaces themselves. I think that there's a huge, uh, let's say, path forward in terms of making sure that you could say the interior, the spatial design, sort of like fits uh, a modern life and that it's explorative and it's, uh, uh, you could say, inviting and it's community driven. So, so, so I see also there's a big shift in one size fits all that has been, uh, let's say, a part of, uh, of the, the 90s and uh, early series to, okay, there's not a one size fits all because interior and spatial design has also to be very, very site-specific and, and, and bespoke in order to accommodate uh, the, the, the need for exploring and, uh, and experiencing uh, the, the city. Here's a few examples of, uh, of uh, projects that uh, we have done. Um, and then finally, I would say that this whole idea of let's say, catering the spaces we have for the broader community is, is really, really interesting. And we had a very, very nice collaboration with a company, a farmer, where we, over a period of three months, uh, had more than 5,000 people coming in for community dinners. Uh, and, and there's a place in Denmark now called Absalon, which is a community house that is really, really interesting also. They have more than 120 different activities throughout a week. And every night they have serving of uh, community dinners, you know, like a few hundred people every night uh, throughout the year. And then you go to ping pong, you go to uh, knitting and sewing, you go to all types of different. So, so this community engagement is, is, I think, super important because the, 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 the crazy idea of making a city that is driven by bricks, and structures and not the social interaction between people is simply wrong. So urban life first, that informs 
public realms, these two combined can inform architecture. Because hopefully, there are people here uh, on a longer, let's say, run than the buildings themselves. We can always do another building if it collapses, you know. And architects should also be a little bit more humble, I think. Because who knows who, who did the Pantheon in Rome or Forum Romanum. or That was built over hundreds of years to accommodate public life. And it was not to, let's say, um, uh, satisfy uh, uh, an architectural uh, aspiration. Yeah, sort of like this. I think it, that was it. <laughs>